Welcome back to St. Thomas Aquinas for everyone. I'm Dave Palmer and we are in our second lesson of four on the law according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Remember the first one on law was just kind of a general introduction. It was very brief. Well now we are going to get right into the heart of it and talk about really one of the most fascinating parts of the Summa and that is the four kinds of law. And the interesting thing about this, as is the case for the entire Summa, it all ties together and most principally it ties together in regard to our final end as you're gonna see as we move through these okay so let's get right to it and again these are the four kinds of law this is probably something you should commit to memory that they are the eternal law they are the natural law the divine law and the human law okay those are the four kind we'll take those uh, in order of how they are presented in the Summa all right, so let's get right at it. Uh, the first of all, this is, again, Prima Secunda, the first part of the second part of the Summa, question 91, article 1, as we get into the law. And Thomas says, whether there is an eternal law. Now, what is eternal law? The best way that I can describe it is the eternal law is everything that is true. Okay, if something is true, it is part of the eternal law because it's in the mind of God. This is true. This statement, it's very simple. 2 plus 2 is 4. That's part of the eternal law. This is part of the eternal law because it is a moral precept. It's something that's true. Marriage between a man and a woman is part of the eternal law. It's also parts of other laws as well. Okay, the, the very growth of a human being, the way that we have organs, the way that our body works, the respiratory, the excretory system, the digestive system, all part of the eternal law because it's true. It's actually something that happens and is good for our body. The rotation of the planets around the sun, the eternal law, and the laws of gravity, okay? And there's, I mean, literally billions and billions of other examples that I could give you. But again, anything that's true is part of the eternal law. And that's, you know, about very wide in scope, as you would imagine. Okay, so Thomas says a law is nothing else but a dictate of practical reason emanating from the ruler who governs a perfect community. Now it is evident, granted that the world is ruled by divine providence, that the whole community of the universe is governed by divine reason. Okay, it's everything. Wherefore, the very idea of the government of things in God, the ruler of the universe, has the nature of a law, and since the divine reason's conception of things is not subject to time, but is eternal, according to Proverbs, therefore it is that this kind of law must be called eternal. Okay, so the eternal law is beyond scope. It's just, again, it's everything. Okay, so now as we get into the other three kinds of law, it's going to be subsets of the eternal law that we're talking about. And the first one is is there a natural law and let me show you a, a picture here and say you're walking down the, the busy sidewalk and you come across this okay and it's uh, obviously a child by herself and she appears to be lost okay why am i putting this picture up here natural law would tell us that we should render aid okay this is a lost child and I don't have to pick up the Bible or the catechism. I don't have to be taught this. We just naturally know that children should be protected and should be cared for. And so a naturally, every single person of goodwill, even if somebody is not of goodwill, they're going to know that this, this child should be protected. Okay, they may not do anything. They may walk right past her, but they know in their heart. Natural law would tell us that this child should be protected by law okay this is natural law this is a human being we know this if we know that this is a child then we would know to protect that natural law would also say care for our parents care for the elderly it doesn't always happen but again this is natural law these are things that we don't have to be taught this is the way thomas explains it he said wherefore since all things subject to divine providence are ruled and measured by the eternal law which we just talked about it is evident that all things partake somewhat of the eternal law insofar as namely from its being imprinted on them they derive their respective inclinations to their proper acts and ends here are a couple of examples now now this is not natural law but i'm gonna this is eternal law is that birds build nests 
beavers build dams okay they just know how to do that that's eternal law now among all others the rational creature is subject to divine providence in the most excellent way insofar as it partakes of a share of providence by being provident both for itself and for others wherefore it has a share of the eternal reason okay well every creature has a share of the eternal reason but only the rational creature is able to reason okay so it's a different subset that the rational creature has where they just know because they're rational what to do under the circumstances of exercising their reason okay wherefore it has a share of the eternal reason whereby it has a natural inclination to its proper act and end and this participation of the eternal law in the rational creature is called the natural nat natural law the bird, birds building nests are not natural law because that's not a, a a partaker of the of rational creatures okay the, the the bird is not a rational creature the 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 beaver is not a rational creature so that which you and i have that we naturally know to do through the the process of our reason is natural law okay that's that part of it okay anything that we kind of know know to do naturally as rational creatures all right i think i explained that well enough okay whether there is a human law okay so now we're we're bringing it into a more practical standpoint and human law is anything that we derive on our own in order to carry out civil society of course and again there's there's thousands if not millions of examples gun laws immigration law you know no, no bicycling on the road you know speed limits i mean you name it okay anything that we come up with as human beings in order to you know rule you know a a culture and to bring order to society would be human law now he's going to make a distinction here between speculative and practical reason spectacle and it's not terribly important right now but we went over it when we were talking about the intellectual virtues speculative has to do with the contemplation of truth and practical has to do with operations okay so uh, he says a law is the dictate of the practical reason now it is to be observed that the same procedure takes place in the practical and the speculative reason for each proceeds from principles to conclusions accordingly we conclude that just as in the speculative reason from naturally known in de indemonstrable principles we draw the conclusions of the various sciences the knowledge of which is not imparted to us by nature but acquired by the efforts of reason okay we reason we come to know things so too it is from the precepts of the natural law as from general and indemonstrable principles that the human reason needs to proceed from the more particular determinations devised by the human reason are called human laws provided the other essential conditions of the law be observed okay this was that's kind of hard to understand but what basically what he's saying is we take the natural law and those things that we know as rational creatures that portion of the eternal law that we have come to know and we apply it to practical circumstances okay things that we need to do in order to order society as i mentioned a moment ago all right so now the final kind of law is divine law and before i get into this i want to go way way back to one of the first videos that we did do you remember the very first article of the summa what it was about okay prima pars question one article one it had to do with whether besides philosophy any further doctrine is required now if you haven't watched the early videos i do recommend that you go back and you watch them because everything builds in the summa but basically thomas was saying that we needed more than what our reason can come up with because our end is supernatural we are destined for a supernatural end which is god which is providence right and so we had to be told things that exceed the capacity of our reason in order because our end exceeds the capacity of our reason okay so just remember that when we talk about divine law so what is divine law scripture would be an example the teachings of the catholic church transubstantiation the assumption of mother mary okay all these things that exceed our natural reason are parts of the divine law right and then anything you know the 
things having to do with Jesus, the incarnation, the resurrection, the bodily assumption, the bodily resurrection of the dead. Okay, these are all parts of the divine law. So how is divine law different from eternal law and natural law and human law? Okay, he says first because, um, yes, there is a need for it. First because it is by law that man is directed how to perform his proper acts in view of his last end. And indeed, if man were ordained to no other end than that which is proportionate to his natural faculty, there would be no need for man to have any further direction on the part of his reason besides the natural law and the human law, which is derived from it, right? But since man is ordained to an end of eternal happiness, which is improportionate to man's natural fa faculty, therefore, it was necessary that besides the natural and the human law, there should be directed to his end by a law given by God, okay? We cannot figure these things out on our own. God has to help us achieve our final end. So the divine law and the first article of the Summa are almost exactly the same, okay? They're basically making the same point. We can't get to our end unless God helps us. And of course, this calls to mind grace the theological virtues, the things, that, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, these are all supernatural, right? Secondly, because on account of the uncertainty of human judgment, especially on contingent and particular matters, different people form different judgments on human acts, whence also different and contrary laws result in order, therefore, that man may know without any doubt uh, what he ought to do and what he ought to avoid, it was necessary for man to be directed in his proper acts by a law given by God, for it is certain that such a law cannot err. So when God teaches us something through Holy Mother Church, through scripture, through the magisterium, you know, what have you, we know it's true because God is truth himself and he cannot err. Okay, so do you know the four kinds of law? Can you explain it to somebody? Can you make it as simple as possible? That's our challenge, okay? They are divine, they're eternal, they are natural, and they are human. Okay, well, you have two more lessons on law before we move on, and we're getting very close to the mid, mid part of the Summa. I hope you're enjoying it. Please like, please forward, please tell your friends about this. Very, very important in our culture today for us to be grounded in good philosophy, okay? This is so important. And I'm so glad that you're journeying with me through the Summa. Thank you for watching and may God bless you.